being added. So I, I think it's a good time to start. Yeah, so yeah. welcome everyone to session 11 on novel applications. So my name is Barbara Weber and I'm going to chair this session. Uh, you already see uh, on the screen the, tri uh, the three presentations that are going to be presented uh, in this session. And the first presentation will be given by uh, Gail. Uh, Cut to the trace, process aware partitioning of long running cases in customer journey logs. And I don't want to take too much uh, time from the presenter. So Gail, the, the floor is now yours. Excellent. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, great. Just a minute. Okay, so um, I'm Gail Berner, and together with my colleague Ahik Sandohovic and Perekis on Hitsos, we are really glad to present our paper, Cut to the Trace, Process Hour, Partitioning of Long-Running Cases in Customer Journey Logs. So we are uh, from the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. Um, in Canada. So today I will give a brief introduction about process mining and um, customer journey analytics. I will then discuss the customer journey partitioning task, then present our solution, the probabilistic customer journey partitioning framework. Then I will present the evaluation of the work and then I will conclude. So let's start with the introduction. So our work is at the crossroad between process mining and customer journey analytics. So I will introduce briefly both disciplines and then explain the link between these two disciplines. So process mining um, can transform an event log into a process model. So using a process discovery techniques and it allows a company to know how a process model is really executed instead of how they think it should be executed. And um, so this is only one type of activity, but you can also take an existing process model and check it against uh, event logs. So check the conformance of event logs. There are many other different types of activities, uh, but overall the process mining framework really allowed to introduce well this uh, discipline. So now I will briefly introduce customer journey analytics. So it's uh, an area that got a lot of attention lately, uh, partly due to the the increasing number of devices, the number of the increasing number of channels and technologies that a customer customer have to consume a service, and due to that, the customers' interaction are said to be more and more complex, and it's also the reason why there is a growing importance of understanding customer journey analytics. So, customer journey analytics is the science of better understanding the uh, customer journey and uh, the motivation and pain that customers are experiencing while using a service. So now the big question is, can we leverage process mining to analyze customer journeys? So in one of our previous work, we show that uh, there are many similarities between these two disciplines, but most importantly, they are both about discrete sequence of events. So this is the reason why um, we believe that process mining could be a nice tool to analyze customer journeys. But now there is also some challenge involved in analyzing customer journeys. And the main one is that in event logs, so in a standard process mining project, you have a nice process instance defined. So you know exactly when the process starts and you know exactly when the process ends. It's not really the case in journey logs because in journey logs, most of the time what you have is a timestamp and a customer ID but you don't exactly know when the journey is starting and when it is ending for a single customer. So I will now use a simple visualization to illustrate what a customer journey look like without a, a journey identifier. So basically the road here could illustrate the journey from a customer. And for instance, we observe four different events from, from this customer. And if we go back in time, we would have many, many events for a single customer. So if we take this entire road and we try to apply process mining on it, 
we would most likely end up with a flower model or a spaghetti model. So a flower model basically expressed that anything can happen and a spaghetti model is a bit too complex to really extract insight. So this is not something that we would like to have. So one solution that was used by the winner of the BPI challenge 2012, and I quote, uh, is to use a parameter, say delta days, to demarcate the boundaries between process instances. So two events or event sequences with a time period between them greater than a delta fall under two process instances. So if I go back to the picture that I used to illustrate customer journeys, that would look like this. So we would have a really long trace. And when we have a long time gap between two different events, we cut the journeys into smaller traces. So now I will introduce our probabilistic customer journey partitioning, which allow to do this kind of task in a structured way. So the core idea of our probabilistic framework is to define a probability function that returns for every event, a probability uh, that it, it is a case ending event so that we should insert a cut. So once we have this function defined, uh, we can partition by cutting up the highest probabilities. So we instantiate the, the framework in three different ways. And uh, the first one is the time hour partitioning. So it's the one that I used in the illustration before and that was used by the win of the BPI challenge 2012. And then I will also show you um, or introduce two alternatives to uh, instantiate our framework. So let's start with the first one, the time hour partitioning, TAP in short. So the TAP um, is the baseline approach because this is one which is already known by the process mining community. And I will show you concretely how it works um, using 10 example, 10 events uh, as an illustration. So here we have 10 events and the different letters represent different type of activities. So the first step in this uh, TAP is to calculate the delta, so the time until the next event. So for instance, here we have 10 because we have 10 units between or 10 seconds between this event and the next event. And now in our framework, what we do is that we cut at the highest uh, probability. So here the probability is only returned by the delta. Um, so it would basically mean that if we want to cut in three, we would insert these three uh, following cuts because these are the highest value uh, in this series here. So we say that this approach is context unaware because it disregards the type of activities that are surrounding the cut. So notice, for instance, that the activity C here, it, it's, it is often preceded by the activity B. And there is just one exception. So here it's, you have really not a lot of time between these two activities. It happens again here and again here. And you just have here P and C that have a longer time gap. So because you have a longer time gaps here, it will insert a cut and this solution really disregards the type of activity. So this is the reason why we say that it's uh, context unaware. So um, we also say that this, is, uh, this technique is sensible to uh, outliers. And this is something that we try to solve in the next implementation of the framework. So the idea here is to incorporate some context by analyzing the average time between pairs of activities. So the directly follow uh, relations between activities. So here I listed the, the context. So for instance, the average time between the activity P and C is two. So in this, we, we call it the local context process hour partitioning. So the local context, because the local context represents the pair of activities. So here for the function uh, in our framework for to de determine which event is the case ending event, event we use this average time. So as an illustration here, if, I, if we use the average time, it would insert the following uh, cut. And you can see that here, it has an, uh, as an effect to keep P and C together in the same uh, traces. So now we take um, for the third um, instantiation, we take the 
context a step further. So um, here we are not taking only the pair of activities, but we are really um, considering a really rich um, set of context um, composed of five different inputs that we feed to a neural network. So I will show you in the next slide how the neural network looks and what are the five different inputs. But here, the most important part is that in the GCPAP, so the Global Context Processor Word Partitioning, we treat this task as a regression task. So given the really rich context, we try to um, predict when uh, the next event will happen. And so instead of cutting at the largest time delta, we cut at the largest predicted time delta. So, um, it, in a way, the neural networks extract some knowledge that are hidden in the data and we can really analyze the, 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 how the events are organized and why some cuts should be uh, inserted. And um, um, it's because it's doing this using neural network, it, it will not be sensible to outliers because it really tries to extract some information from uh, the, the event plot. So now I will explain uh, the five different inputs and how the output look like of the neural network. So let's say we are at this activity, uh, the event here, here, this P. The output of the neural network is the time delta until the next event. So we are uh, training the neural network to uh, predict when will the next event happen. And as an input, we use five different inputs. So the two first inputs are the different type of activities here and the time uh, delta that are on the left. So in the experiment, we set the window to 10. So we, ta we take the 10 event on the left of the event. We also take the activity type here for the current event. And we do the same for the right part of the event. So the context is really composed of a lot of things. So the, the activities that are on the left, the time gaps that are on the left, and same for the right, and we also take the current activity. So in summary, we, we instantiate the framework in three different ways. So we have the TAP, which relies solely on the time between events to predict the cuts. We have the LCPAP, which is using the mean time between directly follow relation to insert the cuts, and the GCPAP, which is using a really rich um, context using neural networks and LSTM to predict when the, we have to insert a cut. So it results in three different cuts. And now I will uh, uh, explain how we evaluate this, um, these three different solutions. So the experiment that we conducted uh, works as follows. First, we use a known process model to generate traces and we build customer journeys by concatenating traces. And then we use a person process with a rate of one to simulate the intertime event. And we add a delay for the intertime for new traces. So it will become clearer with an illustration. So the process model that we use for the experiment is the one that you can see here. And we use this process model to generate traces. We concatenate them. So here we have four different traces. We concatenate them and we use the person process to simulate when the next event will happen. Then, as I mentioned earlier, we add a small delay when we are at the case ending event. So here the delay is 0 0.1, but of course we try the experiment with different values for delay. So the lower the delay, the harder is the task. So then we take the sum and so what we do is that the partitioning technique will, will see only the information here. So we, it will see only the activities and the simulated uh, time until the next event. And the goal is to retrieve the true partition. So if we use TAP here, it would insert these three different cuts. And you can see that it was right only one time and to time the cut was wrong. So this is the experiment that we conducted. And we use a rock curve to evaluate the results of this experiment. So here I'm showing the rock, one of the rock curve uh, for a delay of 0 0.1. So 0 0.1, um, uh, you have to 
to know that the, 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 the Poisson rate is uh, one. So um, a delay of 0 0.1 is quite hard because it doesn't add a lot of delay. So you, you don't have a large time gap between different journeys. And you can see that the TAP uh, here performed quite poorly um, because it's not far away from a random guess with a, an area under the curve of 0 0.55. And you can see that using the context, so using the LCPAP or the GCPAP, we can really boost the area under the curve. So now I will show you the same results, but with a higher delay. And you can see here that the TAP uh, performs a little bit better already with an area under the curve of 0 0.69, but still the GCPAP and LCPAP are way better. Now there is also a drawback of using a more involved partitioning technique uh, is in the execution time. So if you take the, the TAP, uh, because it's only looking at the time gap, it will always take less than one second to compute, even for really large event logs. And for the LCPAP, it's still okay because it's only calculating the mean time. So it will take less than 10 seconds, even for la large event logs. But of course the GCPP relies on a neural network with L LSTM. So it's quite complex and it will take uh, up to one hour if you have large event logs. So now we also um, tested our approach, sorry, for, for the synthetic experiment, we try with uh, 11 data sets and the LCPAP and GCPAP were uh, constantly outperforming the, the TAP. So for, for 11 data set in a synthetic, uh, in the synthetic experiment. Now we try the, the, the technique with a real data set. So Evaluating this kind of approach with a real data set can be a little bit tricky because usually if you have customer journeys, you don't have the ground truth uh, journey ID. And we, we don't know any uh, customer journey data set where we would have the ground truth, uh, except maybe uh, for this one. So it, it is from a ticketing tool um, from the city of Lausanne. And here um, in a ticketing tool, it's a little bit particular because when a customer call a call center, uh, you would typically open a ticket uh, and every time the customer is calling back, so every time you have an interaction with the customer, you would refer to the ticket ID. So in a way that the ticket ID works as, a, as the journey identifier. So here the experiment was to remove the journey identifier and the goal of course is to try to find back the real tickets. So here you can see that still the GCPAP outperformed the two other approach and TAP is the last one. And you can also notice that the performance, the boost in the performance is not as strong as with the synthetic evaluation. And this is, we believe it is due to the fact that in a real life setting, the time between two different journeys is usually much higher than what we have used in the experiment. Uh, but nevertheless, it shows that uh, we can uh, improve the partitioning of traces in a real setting. So I'm close to the end of this presentation. So as a conclusion, I would say that applying process mining to understand customer journeys hinders some really interesting challenges. And the fact that usually you have really long uh, traces in customer journeys and you don't have a well-defined trace ID uh, make the application of process mining quite difficult. So partitioning the traces is one of the approach that can be used to start using process mining to analyze customer journeys. And um, our framework offer uh, different with our framework, you have different, you have three different ways you can implement or you can do the cut. And um, also the framework is quite flexible. So you can also adjust it uh, for a specific use case and use some business knowledge um, to um, make the function works in a particular context. And uh, also just as a final word, uh, the time until the, the next event was something that was already used in the process mining community. 
but it might not, as we have, uh, as I have demonstrated in this presentation, it's not always the best solution. So I would encourage you to, to also try a different technique to, to partition uh, traces. And um, yes, if you have any questions, anything, any feedback, please uh, do not hesitate to let me know. Thanks a lot for your time. Oh, thank you a lot, Gail, for your presentation. So there is now a little bit time left for questions and discussions. Um, so you, you can either post your uh, questions directly in the chat, or you can use the dedicated question and uh, answer tool to uh, post your questions and your feedback. So and um, and. And uh, while I'm while I'm waiting, so I have one question uh, um, of, 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 for you, Gail. Because you, so you mentioned that your focus is on customer journeys, um, and you mentioned that unlike in process logs, what you have in for customer uh, uh, journey maps is a customer ID and a timestamp. So we've done with my group a lot of work on, on looking at, at, at user interactions, for example, in the context of uh, process modeling, but now more recently also in the context of mining, and we, where we have exactly the same information. We have timestamps, we have interactions, and we have usually a session ID, which refers to the participant. Um, so do you think your approach is uh, so is there anything which makes your approach specific for customer uh, uh, journey map journeys or is it or do you think it would be applicable for every type of of, of sequential data where you have this uh, timestamp and and sort of id yes thanks for thanks a lot for your question um so this technique could uh, be applied uh, in process mining. So the partitioning of uh, uh, traces is also relevant in a process mining context, especially when you have really long traces, which was the case, for instance, for the BPI challenge 2012. Um, and also this technique could, uh, could be useful, for instance, in other domain, like in clickstream analysis, where you have sequence of activities and a timestamp. And in uh, clickstream, typically uh, people are using, or other researchers are using the TAP approach. So they are basically uh, defining a threshold to cut different uh, clickstream um, sequences uh, into smaller pieces. Does it answer your question? Um, yes. Um, so um, I'm still not getting any uh, questions from, from the audience, so it would be very nice for Gail if uh, you would uh, drop some uh, questions or uh, 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 feedback for him. Um, so do you, so, so what I'm a little bit wondering, what are the assumptions you are making in, in your approach? Because I mean, what you have um, used for evaluating, I wouldn't typically refer to as a customer, what a uh, 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 journey. So it seems that the ticketing uh, you used, uh, seems to be seems to be a little bit uh, simpler and more well structured than what I would typically expect from a customer journey. Yes, I, I agree with you. Um, this is, we have, in a way, we have to find a solution because I, I agree with you when you have a customer journey, it's really complex and you don't have structure. Um, but also it's, you can apply our technique, but the, the challenge is that you cannot really evaluate the technique when you have a real customer journey and you don't have the ground truth data set. So it's a little bit complex. Um, you can partition the journeys, but then, having a way to assess that the partition was well made uh, is a little bit tricky. So um, using the ticketing tool, I agree with when a customer interacts with uh, a service desk, it's typically uh, less uh, flexible than maybe a real customer journey. But this was one, one of the data set where we had uh, a journey idea that we could use to evaluate our solution. So that the choice was a little bit opportunistic more than yeah. like the perfect choice of the customer journey. 
Okay, thank you. So now there is a question coming up. So what are your plans for this? Uh, uh, so for your future, uh, 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 your future plans for this line of research? Um, so um, right now we are working on different ways uh, that uh, we can use to try to sample different uh, journeys to extract the most representative uh, uh, like customer journey saying, okay, we have thousands of uh, journeys, which one are the ones that are uh, representative of the entire data set? This is something we are working on right now. And um, also more related to the work we, are, we I just presented is um, how can we extend a little bit the context and uh, incorporate other information that just the activities that are on the left and on the right, but also maybe the resource and uh, some other context or the channel that was used by the customer as additional context uh, to improve the partition. So following up on, on that last question, so do you also plan, I mean, since you managed, mentioned that there is not, not really a data set out to evaluate your work, do you plan to develop a data set so that you can really evaluate your approach in a realistic setting? Is that also part of your agenda? Um, if some other researcher would like to join with me to, to conduct this kind of task, I, I would be really happy. I think it's, it's a difficult task um, because it's, it's difficult to generate. If you generate the, the synthetic data sets, you would always, uh, you, you, you cannot guarantee that it would look like in a real life setting. And if you take real customer journeys from a real life setting, I think the customers are the only one that can um, approve, uh, like that can double check that it was the right journey. Um, that for instance, you had two events that were close to each other. Maybe you, you think it's, they are coming from the same uh, journey, but the customer might disagree and because the customer maybe was doing two different things. And I think uh, the real, journey identifier would come from the customer. So now uh, uh, conducting surveys to, uh, to make sure that the journeys are correctly identified. Uh, I think it, it's a really interesting things to do, but it might be a little bit tricky. Okay, uh, so thank you, thank you, uh, Gail, for your for your presentation, also for the for the answers. There are no, I don't see any more questions popping up. So I would suggest that we are moving on now with the with the second presentation. So there is already. Uh, thank you so much for for your time and for the question. So I think we lost Barbara. Um, all right, I'll move on. Uh, presently, the next speaker, um, who is Hassan Emre Hayretsi. Sorry if I pronounced incorrectly your name. Um, he will present the multi case study on legacy system migration in the banking industry. Emre, you can take over from now. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you in the case uh, 21 and uh, presenting our study on uh, legacy system migration in banking industry. Uh, I'm here with uh, Basha Kaidemir, uh, who's a state professor in, in Boston University. Uh, so I've been a student in the Boston University and uh, and Brad Dunn, the co-founder of Definex Technology Consulting, and we've been studying on uh, banking industry, especially in legacy system uh, modernization projects for more than a decade. Uh, the agenda of today is I will be briefly talking about uh, the background of uh, what the banking industry is doing and you know, why these legacy system migrations are important. Uh, briefly talk about our research methods, and we have three cases that we have been observing in the scope of this uh, study. So I'll be sharing the uh, information about these as well as uh, the, uh, our research questions. Uh, a brief notes about the related works and uh, conclusions and further studies uh, will be the agenda of today. 
So if I give you a brief uh, summary about what's going on in the banking industry, it's, uh, there are key changes in this industry uh, that requires some modifications to the architectures. Uh, the changing customer behavior is, is the key driver of this. I mean, nowadays, uh, approximately uh, in a bank, uh, in about two, uh, 10, 20 years ago, you know, we've been visiting a bank once a month. Right now, you know, people are logging into the bank to their banks to do you know, transactions or reading what's going on uh, more, than, more than one or two times a, a day. And that requires a significant number of uh, transaction processing in the banking uh, industry. Besides, you know, the banking is not just doing the banking, but they're also providing additional services uh, with these digital uh, uh, disruptions that, that, that we've been experiencing in the last uh, three to five years. Technology is also changing a lot. Uh, the analytics capabilities, the cloud capabilities, uh, and, and uh, artificial intelligence usage in, in the banking uh, interfaces it drives banks to take significant actions on providing their services and there is a, an intense competition that is going among the banks and that brings banks to look for a, a more resilient scalable and modular architecture with modern design principles and that's a continuous uh, change in the banking industry uh, if you look at a typical bank the bank operates a system called core banking system and these systems that are uh, developed first time in the 70s is a black box that works uh, for the banks operating mainly. Uh, here you see the uh, evolution of, of the core banking system or the banking system of a typical retail bank. Uh, on the left hand side, it's the architecture of 2000s, where you have the core banking system that serves uh, the bank, and you have an online banking system that serves the customers, and you have a very primitive business intelligence architecture. When we come to the 2010s, you know, with the introduction of mobility, uh, new channels are added to these. Uh, besides internet banking, there is additional uh, channels that, that we observe. And the banks separate or divide their channel architecture. Uh, about five years ago, this has been identified insufficient and the banks require to do more analytics, understand their customer data and their customer needs. So they have uh, implemented projects mostly around analytics capabilities and they do some modernization on their corporate database and data models. In today's world, you know, the banks are moving into more uh, integrated uh, architectures where they are becoming part of ecosystems. So besides the introduction of digital ecosystems around them, so robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, are the additional uh, features that the banks added to their architecture. Uh, so which forces them to move from their old core to the new core architecture, mainly based on microservices. Uh, so migrating a bank from an existing architecture to a modern architecture is, is a continuous effort and it's not something that can be done in, in, a, in a one or two years time frame mostly. It's, these are projects that involve you know, more than, uh, you know, the, the smallest one is around 100 people and it, could, it goes you know, uh, beyond uh, 500, 600 people working for many years on these projects for migrating bank from one architecture to the other. And uh, this migration uh, is, is, is an, uh, it, 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 it requires lots of thinking around, you know, uh, the, its strategy, the approach that is being conducted and the way it's been executed. So in this study, we have been examined three banks, three large retail banks in Turkey, uh, uh, which they have been migrating their core systems from one place to the other you know, between 2014 to 2020. Two of these transformations are still going on and we still continue our investigations over these modernizations. Uh, and uh, typically we examine these in these four steps. So definition of the migration strategy and uh, uh, Secondly, we identify an approach on how we are going to uh, define uh, the design of the, of the migration. 
the third step is about uh, understanding how you're going to prioritize significant number of applications in these systems. You know, what is the best way to uh, order them? And last step is typically the execution, which is the longest step that takes place. As I said, this may take you know, up to three, four, five years easily. Uh, so in our multi-case multi -case study on the legacy system migration, basically we have investigated these three things and we look to answer three key questions. One of them is which are the key motivation for banks to start their transformation from legacy systems towards the next generation architecture. So how these motivations have been identified and how the motivations impact the typical migration paths and, uh, and, and strategies that they're choosing. The second question is the strategy for application migration. One of the key challenges is uh, about uh, identifying you know, what is the best way to uh, define the migration path. And who does this and how it's been done is uh, changes uh, the, the who uh, program itself and the, the, the migration execution path. So investigate uh, and uh, observe what's been going on for these three cases. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, the key question is about you know, how are you going to prioritize the applications that are in the scope of these core systems and in which order you need to execute this migration. Uh, in terms of research methods, uh, we have you know, conducted several interviews with key uh, C-level executives. Uh, so more than 19 executive uh, meetings, interview, meet, interviews conducted with C-level executives involving CEOs and CTOs of these banks. And we have conducted more than 260 hours of focus group meetings with the key stakeholders uh, who are the uh, stakeholders of these transformation programs, such as transformation program managers, enterprise architects, lead architects, domain architects, and software engineers that have been working on these, you know, uh, huge projects. Uh, if I briefly talk about our cases, so we are looking here for three banks, which are similar in terms of uh, which, which are identical to each other in terms of sizes. So these are large retail banks. Uh, and you see that ATMs is automatic credit machines. So each of them has uh, an ATM connection uh, from 4,000 to 6,000. Their branch sizes vary from 850 to 1,200 branches that is spread across the country. They have about you know, 9 million to 19 million uh, active customers. Uh, the digitization of, of the banking customers is high in, in our country. Uh, as we see, despite the number of customers are different in Bank A and, and Bank C in, uh, compared to Bank B, uh, in terms of digital customers, they're almost identical. So it's, it's somewhere between seven to nine million digital customers connecting to these banks. In terms of total asset sizes, these are in Turkish lira, so you need to divide it by eight figure out you know, what it means in terms of US dollar. Uh, so these are large banks with large asset sizes. So uh, what we do in our study is we looked into the Aziz uh, status of these banks and uh, uh, figure out what type of an architecture that they have been working on. And of course, you know, each of them followed a different path that I will be sharing shortly. Uh, but where they are, are important in the way that uh, they decided also to their migration. So Bank A is, has been running their migration from mainframe based systems to open systems since 2005. Uh, they started this journey in 2014, the one that we observed. Uh, up until that time, they have already migrated some of their application from mainframe to Java based custom applications. So none of these banks are using any licensed banking software. So all of their software are customs and in-house developed. So Bank A is running on a three-tier architecture. Uh, and it's, its presentation there is based on Java, uh, web and mobile. So they have an integration layer. An integration layer, they're using API platform, business process management and enterprise service bus for various reasons. And at the back end, they have custom applications with Java JTV and .NET. And they still have some mainframe codes that are running on uh, IBM IMS with COBOL. Their data layer is the mainframe DB2 and Rocket. Uh, 
Uh, and as I said, in this scope of the project, they have been migrating from this architecture to more service-oriented architecture that uh, I was sharing briefly. The Bank B uh, has merged two banks in 2006, and uh, in this uh, MMA, mergers and acquisition, they have already migrated themselves outside the mainframe. They have been totally running on open systems. So their front end is Java. They don't have ESP or VPN. They just have an API layer, and they have the backend custom applications, uh, and they have Oracle at their backend layer. Bank C is the one that has started last in this transformation, but they had a very modular mainframe architecture that they could be able to leave in the last 20 years. Their front end is on Java base, but their integration layer and their backend and database uh, was uh, were, were on mainframes when they started this migration. So having uh, given giving this background of the banking architecture, uh, I we also collected some more information about how the typical systems looks like. So in, a, in, in bank A, we are talking about 15 different channel applications. Uh, and bank B and C are at the similar sizes. They have external APIs that they call to connect to you know, uh, outside world, mostly in scope of the digitization. Uh, bank A has 17, bank B has 15, and bank C has 70 different APIs that they connect to the outside the bank. In terms of internal APIs, the, the numbers are different because they are based on their different architectures. As I said, Bank A started this migration to open systems way long compared to the others. And they have been progressing in the service-oriented architecture on the way. So they have developed their uh, backend systems as APIs uh, way long ago, and they have high number of APIs. Uh, whereas Bank B and Bank C were still, uh, you know, very monolith applications, and they have low number of APIs uh, that allows them to uh, connect the applications or run the applications. A typical bank has approximately 2,000 functions, and its functions mean screens that does business you know, executes business logic. Uh, in Bank A and Bank B, these are numbers varies from 1,000. 2000, whereas Bank C has 8,800. It's huge as they have been running mostly on mainframe, and the way business logic divided the mainframe is different than the others. Domains uh, are where the application is being grouped. So, especially when we are talking about microservices architecture, these are typically the uh, microservices groups that will be seen around. And again, the, each bank has different type of organizations internally. And it varies from 19 to 200. And backend services, as you see here, you know, gigantic service numbers. So these banks typically operate with IT workforces from you know, 1,000 people to 3,000 people. And we are talking about the migration of these systems from existing world to a more, more modern uh, architecture. Uh, if you look into our uh, research questions, the key motivations for Bank A. Uh, well, there are some motivations that are identical in each other. Each of them are still, you know, are, are, are willing to move new products into market faster. So slow time to market was a continuous requirement of motivations for them, uh, especially in Bank A and bank, bank B, because, you know, they see themselves still slow while they were running on open systems. Whereas in Bank C didn't have this problem, uh, but they said that you know, they, they also would like to include their time to market. Uh, Bank A has low data quality problems because regulations and continuous change in the banking architecture you know, brings the banks down you know, more frequently compared to the past. And that's the biggest issue that, that, that they have, so losing the customer trust. So they would like to avoid these quality issues. So Bank B has also quality issues, but this is more driven by the application quality. So rather than the data quality, but they have similar similarities, you know, that they have identified for studying the program. Bank A said they have limited multi-channel capabilities, low scalable and performance, and they're looking for a more resilient uh, system because they observe that the number of transactions that they are processing daily is increasing every year. So just to give a figure, uh, Bank A has been running today 200 million transactions per day. And this is almost 20 times more compared to the five years ago. 
and maintaining the existing architecture and just you know uh, trying to scale it is either too costly or you know sometimes they wish to their limits and be possible so therefore they have this uh, force majeure situations to migrate uh, themselves to the modern architecture. Bank B, uh, which has migrated already to open systems, but it's an old architecture and they have monolithics. They would like to reduce waste, meaning they are continuously renewing the same applications and they would like to avoid renewing uh, the existing applications, but instead they would like to deliver more, more value. And reworks and uh, all these type of repetition, repetitive efforts of uh, trying to modernize the existing thing was, was an issue for them. Uh, and they would like to improve the visibility about what's going on in the systems, who does what. Bank C, which has been living in the mainframe happily for the last 20 years, uh, attracting and retaining the talent was their key problems because they were unable to find people who wants to work in this old architecture. And they would like to reduce their IT cost because mainframe is a costly you know, architecture and they would like to move to an architecture which is resilient. Uh, in terms of migration strategies, uh, there are six migration start strategies that, that we monitor uh, uh, and uh, each bank has applied a different migration strategy. Bank A and B, uh, or Bank A, chooses two strategies to apply. One is retain, which is remediate the application by addressing their pain points and uh, re-architect it, which is about rewriting the application using cloud-based architecture. So Bank A chooses a strategy on two folds. You know, on one hand, they're going to rewrite everything, but on the other hand, they need to still remediate some of the application addressing their pain points. Bank B, on the other hand, which has been running already on cost, low cost infrastructures, they wanted to move to cloud, but moving to cloud with the existing monolithics, still provided that they have smaller applications, they find a way to move the applications as is, uh, as much as possible. So move these applications to the cloud as is, whereas there are some domains uh, that they need to refactor and re-architect and apply different uh, architectures such as microservices architecture. Therefore, they also select the re-architect as a, as a migration strategy. Uh, and, and Bank C is similar to Bank A. They were living in uh, the mainframe and they were not able to get out of, out of it completely. Therefore, they retain the existing mainframe applications while you know, they are uh, re-architecting the as existing application. Each strategy has different you know, uh, drawbacks and advantages. They didn't apply in the big place like buy a package and put uh, that instead of the existing one or re-platform the just infrastructure uh, or, or, or operating systems or uh, language modernizations are the paths that they had tried in the past. Uh, and all these three banks uh, just selected these three set of strategies, migration strategies. Last question is about, is about the prioritization and it's the key question. So how you're going to order the application that are going to be modernized. If, if, if you remember from the slide where I shared the number of application, so for bank A, we are talking about 4,000 backend applications and almost you know, 2,000 uh, front-end applications. And bank C, they have around 10,000, 12,000 backend applications and you know, eight to 9,000 uh, front-end applications. So while you have these huge number of applications waiting to be re-architected and migrated, uh, the way you order them uh, and the dependencies among these applications becomes critical. But before doing such a prioritization on the paper, uh, the, the, we observed that the banks have followed different approaches that are mostly driven by uh, the organizations that they have. So Bank A followed a centralized approach. So they kick off a program where they bring architects, program managers, and a special workforce who has done a comprehensive you know, analysis on the migration. They have uh, documented the full migrations on a paper and in a waterfall manner, they have planned the migration. This was back in 2014. It took about four, four and a half years to complete only 80% of this uh, journey. 
And when during our interviews, it reveals that they've selected this approach because they didn't have uh, proper documentation and they didn't have the team's understanding of what they have as is. Uh, whereas they figured out that what they have planned four years ago was completely different than what they have executed. So uh, service-oriented architecture, waterfall approach that they followed didn't work out well for them, but you know they still managed to complete the program, you know, timely, uh, but with limited score. Then B, uh, as they are willing to migrate to domain-driven or microservices architecture, they have selected uh, domain-driven design as their design pattern. Uh, so they decided to conduct these migration plans uh, within the domains. So there wasn't any central team or a governance team that is taking care of the overall migration, but they leave the decisions to domain and each domain is going to re-architect themselves. So what this brings in the end is still the similar architecture, or almost the same bank, but within with different technologies, of course, more modern, more resilient than the uh, uh, architecture. But uh, their decision was relying on the domain's expertise and architects to decide what do they do with their own application. Where Bank C, following uh, the Bank A and Bank B, they select the hybrid approach. So what they've done is they've defined some domains, but they also define the central team. The central team defines the guidelines, processes, and central uh, industrializations method for them. And they leave the domains to drive the designs of their application. So once this approach, you know, put on the uh, on, on the ground, which typically takes about four to eight months uh, for uh, typical banks of running these programs, then the execution starts. And during the execution, this prioritization becomes still an ongoing effort. Uh, during this study, uh, what was our key take takeaways? So as I summarize. Uh, they followed the uh, industrial trends. So CTOs and CIOs are affected by the software architecture trends a lot. So in 2014, you know, service-oriented architecture is a trending uh, architecture. So the bank chooses this approach and all the other web banks were already running either on SOA or treaty architecture. Uh, but the design patterns, how do they design their applications and, or how their applications are being organized is also another uh, aspect of choosing the next generation architecture. And other aspects that we came across in our interviews is the functional application model. So we wrote uh, about this in our paper. Uh, so the banks has different banking functional application models moving from product centric to manufacturing centric and you know, customer centric. And today's, in today's world, we are talking about digital ecosystem centric architecture. So depending on how you want to give your services and the way the applications are organized is changes. And this has a significant impact on the way you, you know, model your migration. Uh, governance and organization uh, is, uh, I said, you know, plays an important role on how you shape it and how you run it. And the prioritization, as I also mentioned, you know, uh, some of them, you know, the Bank B applied surveys and decisions by central governance teams uh, are, are being applied in, in Bank A and Bank B, uh, whereas you know the best effort seems to be, or the best method seems to be, really conducting a central team's uh, analysis initially, and then laying the ground to the domains to decide on the migration prioritizations within the domain seems to be the best way to follow uh, these type of large legacy migrations. Uh, in terms of related work. Uh, I mean, there weren't too many studies as we have done with the comparative analysis uh, on legacy migration. Uh, so there are lots of studies around migration to cloud-based architectures or, my, or, or microservices architectures or SOA. So which is mostly talking about you know these architectures and why it's being done. Uh, but uh, we didn't come across too many studies around uh, you know how this migrations should be conducted in terms of strategies, in terms of prioritizations, and in terms of execution. And we believe that we contributed uh, with, with our study to this area, to these areas. And, and coming to the conclusion, 
uh, I already mentioned about it, but uh, most urgent issues of the banks shapes their motivations uh, and decisions on target architecture heavily influenced by industry trends. Multiple migration strategies taken into account for legacy migration projects and culture and strong governance bodies shapes how the migration is planned and applications are prioritized. And migration from monolithic to next generation banking architecture is a very complex and long running process. So detailed migration planning and governance are critical success factors. So our studies are still going on with these banks and um, uh, as a future work, what we see can contribute or you know, the similar study can be executed on different organizations with smaller monolithic to see if they found you know, similar methods or the methods are also changing. Uh, we are further investigating the governance methods and identify a set of you know, metrics that could be used, the best way to run these type of programs. Uh, microservice identifications is the one of the key discussions among the architects and the program managers. Uh, there are some identification techniques that are already available, uh, but these techniques can be either enhanced or you know, more frameworks or techniques can be uh, identified for this type of migration. And uh, application migration prioritization is not the one thing that you do once and then you execute. It's a continuous effort. So mathematical and tangible models can be developed on this migration is being uh, identified or modeled. And then the teams and the organizations can continue to see what should be the best next candidate application for attending to the migration execution journey. I think I came to the end of my presentation. Uh, we thank a lot for listening. I don't know if we have any time for questions and answers, but happy to answer if you have any later on as well. So, so thank you very much for your presentation. So we have not much time left since you since you had uh, quite an, a detailed presentation, very interesting one, thank you. But uh, I think we could handle one uh, short question with a short answer. So in the audience, is there someone who has a question uh, in terms of this, uh, for this presentation? Not seeing anything yet. Barbara, we can't hear you anymore. You I cannot can hear, hear me Barbara. anymore? Yes? Can you hear me? You are not muted, but we can't hear you. That's interesting. Because I have everything turned on. I don't know why it's not working. I can hear you. You hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So it's interesting. So some of the audience is hearing me, some isn't. Good. So one very brief question. Um, can't hear Barbara. Um, Hassan, I've, uh, uh, I've, I've one brief question for you. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yes. Um, so, so I, I'm not sure whether I've seen that correctly because you went quite quickly over some of the slides. Is it correct that none of the banks has touched their core banking, but the, the modernization was depending on the bank components around the core banking system? Is that correct? No, each of these banks are touching their core banking. So it's really all about the modernization the core banking itself. So all these banks are rewriting their core banking with an approach which we call digital decoupling. So slice by slice, they divide the existing core banking and rewrite it on the new architecture. Two of them on microservices space architecture yes. and the first one is on service-oriented architecture. Okay, and the ones going for the microservice oriented one, I mean, you mentioned domain driven design and did they really go, I mean, for the, so really for clean microservices in the strict sense. And I'm wondering uh, how they were, um, whether they faced any, any uh, 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 challenges. Yeah, good question, Barbara. Uh, uh, they, they were not. 
unfortunately. So this bank B has approximately, if I'm not mistaken, 29, 26 domains, and these domains are still big. So when the, when they do the you know the microservices in these domains, so each domain represents one monolith microservices. Okay. Uh, when they when they decided to divide the applications into smaller microservices, then they needed to really go around the other domains, which requires a deeper study, which Bank C is attempted to do, but the Bank B decided not to do it. So within a domain, they are able to create microservices, but across the domains, since there is no one looking across, then the bank is not uh, expected to have a clean microservices-based core banking. So this mm -hmm. bank is still in the second year of their migration. They still have four years in front of them to complete the whole migrations according to their current plan. Bank C is started one year ahead. So they're in the first year of the execution, uh, but their approach is identifying these cross microservices or cross functional services that could be also implemented in few microservices. Mm -hmm. uh, they're much more closer to the uh, best practice in microservices implementation. Mm -hmm. So th thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are already out of time. Um, so uh, uh, thanks, thanks for your uh, okay. presentation. And we will now move to the third pres presentation. Um, a reference architecture for IoT enabled dynamic planning in smart logistics. Yeah, that's me, that's me. And in, I will uh, share my screen and in the meantime, congratulations, everybody. We have made it to the final presentation of the Kaiser 21. So uh, we survived. <laughs> we had a lot of inspiring talks and a lot of new ideas. And uh, it's a great honor to close this uh, uh, conference uh, by sharing our ideas. Um, so my name is Martijn Koot. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the Dutch University uh, uh, yeah, in Enschede, uh, University of Twente. Um, and, and yeah, I like everything that moves. I like trucks, I like ships, I like airplanes, uh, automated assembly lines, everything that is, has to do something with uh, logistics is my field of uh, interest. Um, and during this presentation, I will, ex yeah, I will discuss with you which new IT advancements can help us to improve that logistics domain. Um, and, I will in and I will introduce that by showing you a uh, an, an, uh, map, map of the world. Uh, I hope that you can see my slides, by the way. Um, uh, can I maybe uh, ask one of the other presenters, do you, do you see my screen? I don't know if it works properly. Yeah, it works. Okay, okay, okay. Then I only have to select the pointer there we are so i'm here right in the netherlands i'm living in enschede and uh yeah uh, when corona wasn't there we should have been here in melbourne on the bottom right of the map um so and if you look at this map this view you can look at multiple perspectives to it um, but how i look at it is the the globalized economy that we have we can see all these countries and we can see all these industries that are working everywhere but in modern day logistics all those industries are in, interconnected with each other. So we have uh, products coming from Australia, going to the Netherlands, are fabricated there, exported to the rest of the world and for other countries as well. But then this year, boom, there was a big, uh, a big uh, disruption in that global supply chain. Uh, th there was a big ship, the Evergreen container ship, which got stuck in uh, the, the Suez Canal in Egypt. Uh, that was quite an issue because 40% of the trade volume globally goes by that canal. And suddenly that canal was blocked, so no trade anymore over there. And that raised a lot of questions uh, like, oh, whoops, what do we have to do? How can I still receive my products that are on the ship on time? And all those vessels that were coming after the, the Evergreen, they were also blocked, couldn't have any entrance to the Mediterranean Sea or the Red Sea. Um, so th this, th this incident showed how, how, how all those uh, activities in the global supply chain are linked to each other and how important it is that they are working reliable because if one of those chains uh, collapse, yeah, that, then, then we have an issue. But that is not a major story that I would like to share with you because I want to highlight one of those opportunities that arise during that uh, blockage. So, all those ships that are going on the sea, these container freighters, they have IT equipment in there. 
we, we can see uh, their location by using GPS trackers. We have uh, identification tags of, on the, the containers. Um, so in the port of Rotterdam, which was the final destination of the, the Evergreen, they used that real-time information of all the ship's locations to derive a new platform in which all the logistics parties could see where the, the ships were at that point of time, so that they could estimate the, the, the arrival time of the ship in the port of Rotterdam. And it sounds like, ah, oh, yeah, nice that they did that, but then you wonder why didn't they do that before? The, 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 suddenly there was a disruption, we had to, to rearrange uh, our logistics, uh, logistics processes suddenly. Um, and then some smart people thought like, hmm, maybe we can use the track and trace information that is there already uh, and make their new, new website uh, so that the, 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 the truck companies and the, the queue operators uh, could, could, est could schedule their performances better. So what this actually me meant is that the, the, um, the smart uses of the track and trace information in the, on, on those ships allowed the, the logistics parties to become more flexible in the operations and therefore also to maintain high reliability performances. So then you can raise yourself the question, why do we have to wait for a disruption event in order to make all these nice scheduling tools work? We, 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 we have the equipment there, we have the hardware already installed. There's a lot of money going into those IT investments in the logistics uh, chains. And still, we, we, we don't know what to do with it. And that is exactly the main message of our last uh, keynote speaker on Wednesday, uh, Michael Roseman. He was constantly talking about the vortices. So on the figure on the right that you see, we have here the blue line with all those uh, systems that we have nowadays. Uh, so, so we, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, what, what, what we as humans think that we can uh, do with an information system, but the actual implementations that we do can allow us to do much more with what we already think. So that is the main message of my story. So I will discuss this story in five main elements. So first I will dive deeper into the problem itself, uh, how to use that data in uh, terms of logistics planning. And then I will slowly develop uh, an enterprise architecture with you guys to, uh, by starting the requirement analysis and then show how currently operate, uh, logistics operators are using their IT systems in planning and then slowly we're uh, developing towards what we actually want to have as a uh, supporting IT system. And because it's the last presentation, I thought maybe I have to make it a little bit interactive uh, so, that the, so that the people in Australia don't fall asleep yet because it's very late over there. Uh, so I need your input a little bit in chapter three and four. Um, what, what I will ask you to do is to uh, use an interactive uh, tool online, which is called WooClub, and you can anonymously uh, yeah, select your opinions uh, regarding the architectures that we're going to discuss. So I'm a little bit relying on your input as well to uh, conclude this presentation. So first the problem. I said track and trace devices, ships, uh, identification tags. So the, 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 the concept of Internet of Things is, yeah, well accepted in the logistics domain. So we have containers that are emitting data streams. We have uh, air, we, we have products that, that we can track where they are. Uh, drivers of the vehicles, they have those, those uh, PDAs, the personal devices, tablets, smartphones. So the datafication that Suda Ram uh, told us yesterday, that is also happening in the logistics world. But the question is, what can we do with that data? So when you search for smart logistics and uh, you, you always get these type of figures, right? There, there is uh, some, some equipment, you can see container stacks, you can see some trucks, you can see uh, an airplane going over very closely to the ground. It's always the same type of figures, some wifi spots, uh, a, a, a rich businessman who can do nice the thing with the data that we emit. Um, yeah, but then you start wondering, okay, we can include more data into our logistics world, but how can we equip that data to make better decisions? How can we improve logistics decision making by relying on all those new data sources? That is the main question and we need models for that. So here I have two examples of well-known models in the smart logistics domain. So on the left, I have a model uh, from Bing et al, um, in which you can see all the different 
technological building blocks that we need to make the Internet of Things work in logistics domains. So here you can see on top, we have the IoT systems and they collect data. So we have some big data. We, we store that data and analyze that data in cloud architectures. And with artificial intelligence, we can make improved decision making. So decision making is already there, so we can, we can improve it. But in the computer science domain, the figure that is included on the right side, yeah, we also have similar figures, but there it's not the application itself, the, the logistics, the decision making that we want to highlight. Uh, it, it's how the data of those logistics, Internet of Things sensors are moving from the physical objects where the sensors are installed towards the data hubs, towards the applications that we use. And if you closely examine these type of models, you can wonder, okay, where can we use the dynamic, like where can we use that data in terms of planning, rescheduling? Um, is that here? So is, the, is the, the, the fact that we have an arrow between big data and, and artificial intelligence towards the IoT that we can do some decision making, is that it? Or is it the application uh, APIs or the business logic implemented on the right figure? That's exactly what we were wondering, like, okay, how can we make the data work for better planning? So, and luckily one of the authors in 2017, uh, also present at the Kaiser conference, uh, already initiated an enterprise system for that. So here the green blocks are the IT, uh, the, the hardware that we have, the blue blocks are the applications, the software, and the yellow blocks and rectangles and, and dots represent the business processes that we have. And here you can see that there is also a software application tool named Disruption Handler. But still the decision logic inside the Disruption Handler remains unknown. So we know which technological building blocks we need to make Internet of Things work. We know where, where to uh, implement uh, sensors, where to have uh, wireless uh, communication access. Um, but how that data transforms our decision processes themselves, that remains unknown. And that is the major aim of our research. We want to develop a reference architecture in which we highlight how the data needs to be transformed. So it's not a hardware driven story, it's a software one. And that is lacking currently in the logistics domain. So that is the problem. So now let's go to the requirements that we need to have such a system in place. So if we think of the logistics uh, operations, we can think of two important stakeholders. At the one hand, you have the customer who wants something. I want to have a product from A going to B. And on the other hand, you have the party who is going to perform that process, right? So the, the one who is organizing the, the, the fleet to move that product, to pick it up and to deliver it at the customer's location. And what, are, what we already said is that if you want to have a nice proper working system, then you need to be flexible in case a disruption occurs and you have to, in order to make reliable outcomes. So here we see those requirements that we obtained by talking with uh, companies in the logistics domain in the Netherlands, but also by reviewing other scholars in the same field of work, and uh, we derive these requirements. So this is what we want to achieve, a flexible system that allows us to maintain reliable outcomes in the presence of a disturbance. So how are we going to make that work? And for that, we, we had some inspiration from the work by Ponorov and Holcomb um, regarding supply chain resilience, in which we have three major steps to, 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 to accomplish. So first, we want to become ready for an event. So we prepare the logistics organization in case an uh, event uh, uh, comes up. We want to make a proper response for that in order to recover the system performances. So how do we do that? So first we either want to predict or observe disturbances in real life. Then we have to uh, accurately assess the severity of a uh, disruption after which we have to make a decision, right? Minor disruptions can be solved locally and require quick and dirty heuristics to solve while major disruptions like the evergreen stuck in the, the, the Suez Canal uh, may require more computational resources and more time to derive a proper rescheduling uh, uh, response. So uh, once that major disruption affects a lot of uh, different stakeholders, we also have to include the stakeholder and discuss what we need to do with the uh, service level agreements that we have. And that is where the Industry 4.0 or the Smart Logistics Paradigm comes into place. 
So those, those fields explain which uh, design principles are needed in order to make the autonomous working, automated, fully decentralized uh, systems work properly. So on the real-time capability, the sensing capability and the interoperability of systems, we can apply that, we can achieve that by using the IoT sensors that we just discussed and the wireless networks. The, we want to virtualize the system, so we want to make a virtual copy of the actual world and make some prescriptive analytics with that, some simulation in a decentralized way by using cloud architectures, edge computing, these type of techniques in order to make a modular design. So when a disruption occurs that we quickly can move and forward our resources to make the, the logistics processes work better again. So that is a little bit the aim and we can discuss about these requirements because it's uh, subjective. It's how we translate the industry's requirements into our design. But first let let's take a look at what logistics processes currently look like and how the IT the infrastructures support that processes. So here I have a brief explanation of what is done if a disturbance occurs in, I don't know, a truck or a ship that is transporting a good. So first they observe, the fleet coordinator observes that something is going wrong. If nothing, uh, it, it, yeah, they, they, so, so that, that's here. And then they have to reschedule their operations. It's basic as that. And if the disruption is affecting the customer performances as well, for example, the product is delayed it's, uh, or uh, we have higher costs and then we have to notify the customer. And which information systems rely on that process or are supported by that process? That's in, in a sense, a central fleet management system. So most of the logistics operators have a central system with a graphical user interface in which they can see all the trucks, all the equipment, where they are in the world, where they are moving, including their estimated arrival time. And those systems rely on the track and trace services emitted by the trucks or the vehicles themselves. So think of the GPS, track, the GPS trackers, the, the identification tags, or maybe the drivers, which have uh, a tablet on their own. Um, and together with the, the legacy systems or uh, the ERP systems that those companies have, they can keep track of the processes on a daily basis. And once an uh, incident emerges, they look at their graphical user interface, they see that everything is going wrong, and then a person is thinking like, hmm, maybe we have to do something else. So that is the current way of operating. And then you can ask yourself, okay, if you look at that system, is that the autonomous operating system that we envision in terms of industry 4.0 uh, uh, paradigms? So is, can we have real-time data in the, is, is that already there? Are those objects that, sh that uh, gather the data interoper interoperable? Um, and that's the question that I raised to you. So here you have the QR code or a uh, URL. Um, you can use that on your mobile phone or your tablet or your laptop, PC, uh, doesn't matter which one you use. Um, so please get a device log into the system uh, so that we can continue with the presentation. I look at the time, I see that I have to hurry up a little. So in the meantime, I will look how many participants we have in this conference room we have. Nope, that's the wrong one. 59, so I now see that only nine people are <laughs> in the in the Whoop Lab tool. Um, I'm waiting for the 10th, ah, there it is. I will move towards the next slide, but then still the URL is in place, okay? Okay, there we go. Yes, there we go. Okay, here you can see the SS architecture that we have in nowadays logistics operations. And my question to you is rate this system, how well the system performs in terms of the industry 4.0 design principles. So there are six of them. Um, you can press here this figure, so you can look in more detail into the architecture yourself by pressing that one, you see. So here we have the, the figure as well. So take a look at the system 
that we have developed that represents the current way of operating. So it's not what we envision. It's just, okay, how normal logistics processes are performed nowadays. And try to rate those uh, in terms of, okay, do we achieve the, the design principles that we want to have? So how well does our current logistics architecture perform? And for the people who still haven't access towards the tool, you, you can see here on top of the screen the, the URL still. So you can still use that. Let's insert that one in the chat. Maybe that is even better. There it is. I see that slowly the answers are popping in. Only two yet. <laughs> I hope that more people will answer. Yes, and I only have four answers right now, but I can see already that you have quite the similar feelings that I have uh, as well. Because the, the, the hardware is already there, right? We have the uh, GPS trackers. We can see for each vehicle where it is on the world any time, any time of the day. So the real-time data acquisition, that one performs quite well. Um, but the virtualization, so the, 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 the digital twin that we can make of the physical world, there we need some additional tools, some prescriptive, uh, prescriptive analytics, uh, simulation techniques, uh, maybe machine learning in order to predict or prescribe what to do in the case in the disruption occurs and that is currently not the case so nowhere in this system besides of the data mining toolbox that they sometimes use to predict arrival times for example we we, we can't do a lot of smart decisions with the current system yet so um so I, I will forward to the next question because now my question is, okay, we know that the system is not performing according to what we expect or, at what, or according to what we want, but where would you like to make the changes yourself? So you can give multiple answers. So here the same figure is again. So now please give me some feedback. Okay, which component would you like to, to, to modify yourself in order to enable autonomous dynamic planning? So you could just pick a location. I don't know how it works on the laptop. I've only tested this tool via my uh, <laughs> smartphone, but I assume that it's just a click with your left mouse button. And there is already one answer, the dashboard. Somebody wants to change the business processes themselves. I only have two responses yet. Uh, ah, there's one uh, as well. The fleet management system, the data visualizations needs to be adjusted. Yeah, so, true, right? So there are no correct answers, for, of course, because it's, uh, yeah, everybody wants to, uh, can uh, design a system <laughs> as, as, as he, he or she likes. Um, but I highlighted the green areas that, that uh, raised my attention. So, and, and it's nice to see that most of you in the audience have the same expectation as well. So um, now we know the current system and we want to translate that into a system that we actually want. How do we proceed? So here we have the, the requirements that we uh, found out earlier, right? So what we are trying to do now is to change that motivation strategy view into an enterprise architecture that represents what we want. So now we are going to design a system by ourselves. And normally I would explain to you, okay, uh, where <laughs> this is everything we did, but because the figure, it, it's quite um, hard to read those small characters. I, I thought of, okay, I show you the figure again in the tool so that you can zoom in yourself and now just look at the system that we have designed and maybe select the things that you think like, hey, they, they did that differently. So where where did we apply the changes? Not to, This is not at the test, but just to highlight where we think that the modifications are required. 
for sake of the discussion. Yeah, yeah, that is one. Again, you can uh, apply multiple answers, by the way. Okay, two of the uh, the two participants say, okay, we are looking at IoT device themselves. There is some software installed there. That's true, but there's more. And I think because it's uh, quite, uh, that we are approaching the end of the presentation, I will continue uh, and ex briefly explain how we change the model. And then uh, if we still have, have some time left over, we can still discuss what to do. Because here are the changes. We change the process itself, we change the, the application layer itself. And of course, the IoT devices need to have some additional uh, uh, tools as well. Um, so why, so why? So here we have the same to be architecture as well, right? On the left, we have the design principles originating from industry 4.0. On the right, the figure that we have in. So the real-time data acquisition is performed by the IoT devices on the bottom, right? They should be able to uh, communicate with each other uh, via the, uh, the the edge and the FOC, uh, the IoT gateways, and via the internet we can use those cloud services, uh, cloud servers to store the data, to perform the data analytics. So in this way, we should be able to interchange the data in between the nodes where we need the data. The virtualization is performed here in the event-driven optimization collaboration in which we have a prescriptive analytical toolbox and a data mining toolbox, so no data mining anymore only. We also have to insert some operation research techniques. And the major element that we address is the decentralized decision making. So we get rid of the central role of the fleet management system. It's not a, G, an, a, a dashboard anymore alone. We want to have a logistics agent. So we have to want to have software installed on the physical objects that move themselves, that can make decisions for itself. And in case a major disruption emerges, the central fleet management can take over, gather all the essential information in order to assess what needs to be done to maintain supply chain resilience. So all with that, uh, the mod so those same agents allow us to quickly reallocate the physical objects uh, according to the new rescheduling plan. Um, and those services in between the smaller software components allow us to share that very quickly. So here is the, so the main question that I had were in the beginning, right, was, okay, we have, we, we know the technical components, but we have to know the decision logic in order to make this, the, 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 the IoT data properly transformed into rescheduling actions. And here we have the hierarchical disruption handling architecture that we envision. So here we explain the steps that we need to take in order to make that rescheduling work, but mainly due to, uh, to, to the time that I have left, I would love to, uh, to invite you to read the paper if you're interested in the steps that we envision. And I would forward uh, to the final slide that I have. Because it's a system that we designed, right? It's, um, we briefly explained what we have in current day logistics, the IT system that we are support, that are supporting the, now, the operations nowadays. Uh, and we explained how we envision a system that stimulates autonomous decision-making by relying on that IoT data. And then the next question is, okay, does it work? Yeah, th th that was the question that we had as well. <laughs> uh, but when we started experimenting with the system that we, uh, that we envisioned, we came to a lot of questions like uh, when, for example, to reschedule at first place. Uh, so that became a research on its own. So here on the right, you can see a short video of what we actually try to do. So we are trying to use the vehicle routing problem that is common known in uh, operations research uh, and, and, and bombarded with a lot of disturbances in order to learn which disturbances are worth re resolving. So that's the first step in our, in our enterprise architecture that we're trying to implement yet. So the real life demonstrations need to be made first in order to check if everything works. But also the designs that we have showed are open for debate. So for example, we use the belief, desire, uh, uh, intention architecture for our log uh, logistics agents, but other multi-agents architectures are there as well. So which one to choose? You can argue if we need cloud architectures, if the 
edge components themselves, so the IoT devices themselves, uh, have way better computational power in comparison with a few decades before. So since we can implement deep neural networks on edge components already, yeah, how does that change our architectural requirements? Do we need the edge fucking cloud comp architectures uh, exactly if we also take into account that the logistics processes are relatively slow? It's not a car that is has to decide, a self-driving car that has to decide like, oh, wait, uh, I, I see a pedestrian on the road. Do I have to go left or do I have to brake? No, uh, logistic processes take minutes, hours, even days or weeks, so we still have more time. And when do we assess the risk assessment? So that were the major ideas and concerns that we have regarding our system. Um, I hope that I made you a little bit enthusiastic about using Internet of Things uh, in the field of logistics uh, processes um, and how to improve uh, our decisions by uh, when an incident occurs. Uh, so let's go to the questions if we still have time for that. So I would like to give the word back to Barbara and thanks everybody for listening, by the way. <laughs> yes, so thanks a lot for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, so, I mean, time-wise, we, uh, we are already over. I don't know uh, whether we will be kicked out at some point, but in case there are questions, I think we could do uh, uh, one or two in case there is someone in the audience who wants to, who wants to ask. I know that there are a couple of people uh, attending the presentation that are working on uh, uh, also on, on IoT related uh, aspects. So let's see whether there are questions coming and otherwise I think we will wrap up and take things offline. So I'm not seeing anything yet. Oh, and participants are already are already leaving. So what I would suggest, um, um, Madain, so super interesting topic, interesting presentation. Um, um, I think uh, since we are already over time, we will wrap up. Thanks a lot for your presentation. And in case uh, uh, there is someone who is who is um, interested in some more details, and you left all your all your. Um, all your contact details on the last slide. So please get in touch. Um, thanks a lot. And that was now the last presentation of this year's uh, conference. I hope you, you uh, enjoyed uh, Kaisi as much as I did. All the best and uh, goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.